Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Maria Zuber, MIT's Vice President for Research. Welcome to this special meeting of MIT's Climate Action Advisory Committee. The committee is made up of many of the leaders of MIT's climate-focused units, as well as representatives from throughout our community, faculty, students, staff, and alumni. The committee meets six times a year and has been advising me on MIT's plan for action on climate change for the past five years. Today's CAAC meeting is different than our usual meetings in two respects. First of all, it is gonna be devoted to student presentations of their ideas for how MIT can help solve the world's climate crisis. And second, it's taking place as a webcast on Zoom so people throughout our MIT community can observe and later in the meeting, submit their questions. You can submit your questions at the bottom of the live stream through Slido. We won't have time for all of them, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. The people you see on screen are members of the committee, along with six students representing working groups on various aspects of climate action at MIT. I'm gonna ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves now, just their names um, and their affiliations. So uh, let's see. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna go around to the committee here. And if you could just tell everybody um, who you are. Um, I want to do committee and students. So uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, uh, on my screen, uh, Jim Gomes. Jim. Hi, uh, Jim Gomes, uh, Senior Advisor to Vice President Zuber. Okay. Uh, Ron? You're mute, Ron. Ron, you're on mute. Yes, sorry, I'm Ron Perrin. I'm director of MIT's Center for Global Change Science and also its uh, Global Change Joint Program. I'm a climate scientist. Okay, all right, Charlene. Charlene Katzenel, class of 79 and MIT Corporation. Emily? Um, hi, as in Emily. Emily Oh. I'm trying to get uh, Emily. Okay, Emily might have stepped away. Uh, Jasmina. I'm Yasmina. I'm a postdoc at Material Systems Lab and representative for education. Okay, uh, Bethany. Bethany Patton, lecturer and senior associate director for the Sustainability Initiative at MIT Sloan. Okay, Brian. Uh, Brian Goldberg, Assistant Director from the MIT Office of Sustainability. Okay, Gail. Gail Greenwald, I'm the alumna representative, and I'm an early stage investor in clean tech and sustainability. Okay, Bob. Uh, Bob Armstrong, Director of the MIT Energy Initiative and a professor in chemical engineering. Okay, Deborah. Deb Campbell, I lead the Climate Change Initiative for Lincoln Laboratory. Arnov. Hi, I'm Arna Patel. I'm a senior in mechanical engineering, and I'm also the CAAC representative for MIT Divest. Okay, David. I'm David Mazumder, a graduate student in HST and a representative from the on-campus sustainability working group. All right, uh, Clara. Clara, you're muted. Might be me. I'm Kiara. Um, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Hi, I'm Kiara. I'm a junior studying mechanical engineering and economics, um, and I'm the representative for private sector engagement. Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a junior majoring in chemical engineering and representative for the public sector working group. All right, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm also a junior in, oh no, in, in chemical engineering and I am representing the um, structure group. Okay, Anushree. I'm Anushree. I'm a first year representing the investments group. Uh, Diana. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm a life member emerita of the corporation. Okay, Rinda. Hi, my name is Brinda. I'm a graduate student representative at the CAAC. Uh, Chris? 
Hi, I'm Chris Knittel. I'm a professor in the Sloan School and director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research. Uh, John? Hello, my name is John Fernandez. I'm a professor of architecture and the director of the Sustainable, uh, the Environmental Sustain, Environmental Solutions Initiative. Sorry. Okay, spit it out, John. Uh, <laughs> let's see, and uh, Bruce. Oh, am I on this panel? Cool. I'm Bruce Anderson. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see my face up there early on. I wasn't sure I was part of the panel. Uh, my name is Bruce Anderson. Um, I'm, an, I'm an alum from the architecture and engineering departments. And uh, I have a company called 24 seven solar. Uh, and I'm part of CAAC. Okay, all right. So as you can see, we've got a um, pretty diverse group of participants on the committee. Um, and, um, and we welcome our, uh, our students and postdocs. So as MIT prepares to adopt a new plan for action for climate change this spring, uh, my office has been conducting a series of conversations, meetings, and events to receive community input. 10 days ago, we hosted a Zoom forum along with uh, the Facilities Department and the Office of Sustainability on what we can do to reduce MIT's own carbon footprint. In the coming weeks, we will be holding forums hosted by the MIT Energy Initiative and the Environmental Solutions Initiative about how MIT engages around climate with governments, companies, NGOs, and other academic institutions, as well as civil society. And you can find out about these forums on MIT's climate web portal at climate.mit.edu by clicking on MIT resources. So we're gonna to begin today's meeting with some brief video presentations prepared by six student working groups who've come together to offer their views on how MIT can set and achieve more ambitious goals. After the videos, the committee will discuss some of the ideas presented with our student guests, and then we'll open up the forum to questions from our Zoom audience. So, um, so let's begin with the video. So let me tell you at the beginning um, who will be presenting here and then we'll just show um, uh, the videos one right after uh, another. So uh, the first one will be on education by Jasmina Burek. So she's, uh, you met her, postdoc in materials uh, research and she's a member of our committee. Uh, then Laura Chen will talk about the structure of climate action plan. Uh, Kelly Wu will talk about engaging with the private sector. Uh, Anushri uh, Chaudhry will talk about investing. Uh, Kiera, and I'll get your name right this time, Wanshaft, engaging with the private sector. Um, and let's see. Um, and then uh, David Mazumdar will talk about uh, on-campus sustainability. Uh, okay, so why don't we, um, why don't we run the videos? I wanted to thank everyone for coming and a special thank you to Maria Zuber, Jim Gomes and the CAAC for hosting this forum. Today, we are going to share a proposal for the climate action plan that has been compiled based on months of gauging student priorities through discussions with 10 different student groups and a survey. Over the past few months, we have learned, we have had around 30 students broken into working groups addressing the six key topics shown to the right that students have identified. So we're going to start with our proposal on the structure and process behind the climate action plan. To guide climate action planning, we developed three core principles represented by the acronym ART. First, accountability involves building strategies so individuals within and beyond the MIT community can help MIT achieve its climate goals. Second, diverse and appropriate representation should be present throughout all processes, including planning, publishing, implementation, monitoring, and adaptation. Lastly, transparency is necessary, as it is one of the first steps to increasing accountability and representation. In light of these principles, we propose the MIT Climate Council. The Climate Council will consist of committees that focus on specific aspects of MIT's climate action and will include existing initiatives. Each committee reports to a larger governing body in a consensus building-like structure and will have a chair elected by the members of the committee 
with the responsibility of communicating the committee's progress and decisions to the steering council. The steering council is the ultimate decision making body. Kelly will now elaborate more on the committees. In order for the committees to be effective in carrying out plans, membership must be representative. In general, committees should have representation from administrators in relevant offices, interested faculty and staff, graduate students, undergraduates, and perhaps also alumni. We propose that student representatives be elected positions with term lengths to allow for increased participation. The committee's responsibility will be multifold. They will be the key players in proposing goals to set, following through with implementation of these goals, tracking progress on goals and publishing updates, and incorporating input from the broader community. We firmly believe committees should be the bodies responsible for setting new goals and writing goal updates in their specific areas due to the wide ranging expertise group members will have collectively. Sustainability priorities are changing rapidly, and in order for MIT to be the role model that it must be on the climate crisis, our CAP must be able to adapt to science and society. So we want the CAP to be a living plan. The committees outlined before will recommend revisions following monthly meetings, and when major changes are made to the CAP, an iterative drafting process that engages with the MIT community is relevant both at the inception of the CAP these next four months and also in our proposed living document going forward. And we ask that you release multiple drafts over the course of these next few months of what goals you are considering and allow for public comment and iteration on this plan. MIT will be much more effective at achieving necessary goals when it engages the community in the most transparent measure possible. Any revision should be publicly accessible on a centralized hub and this will help showcase MIT's efforts in prioritizing sustainability so that they could be leaders in the eyes of the public and other institutions. So inside the plan itself, we want to see an implementation plan for extensive specific targets that could fit into various sustainability, sustainability topics that fit MIT's values. As you can see on the right, the implementation plan should lay out timeline, actions, and actors who will follow through on these actions, as well as a budget. The committees would perform cost benefit analyses to strategize on how MIT could break boundaries and set goals that are both ambitious and feasible. The CAP will also lay out the framework for the Climate Council we mentioned, revision processes and locations for finding plan revisions and progress reports. To conclude this segment of the presentation, we would like to provide two key takeaways. First, the centrality of the art values, and second, the actions that MIT can take to align with these values. Mainly, we ask that MIT create a Climate Council, a unified governing body that promotes accountability, representation, and collaborative problem solving. We also ask that this spring, MIT have an open, iterative, and transparent drafting process in which the Institute releases multiple drafts, listens to community feedback, and uses that feedback to revise the plan. And finally, we ask that both this and future climate action plans be treated as living documents, documents that can change and adapt, just like the planet they are designed to serve. Hi, everyone. I'm Disha, joined here by Will and Chiara on behalf of the MIT Climate Action Plan's Public Sector Engagement Working Group. We're going to provide some recommendations to strengthen MIT's involvement in public sector engagement, particularly toward making new and ambitious climate policy. To make these recommendations, we conducted over 10 interviews with faculty, staff, and officials who are associated with these MIT and City of Cambridge bodies. These interviewees helped us contextualize existing public sector engagement on climate action, gave feedback on our recommendations, and formed ties with our group so that we can keep collaborating in the future. Through those interviews and other research, we cataloged the widespread yet fragmented MIT efforts to inform climate policy which you can now see here. While members from across MIT, ranging from students like us to high level faculty are involved in public sector engagement, we really wanna highlight that this engagement is mainly being done by individuals who are building personal relationships on their own time, rather than with support from MIT. Overall, those efforts really show that MIT has plenty of untapped potential to strengthen public sector engagement toward building climate policy. And MIT can do so in five key ways, through coordination on existing engagement and opportunities for new involvement, through providing incentives and funding to make engagement possible, 
and setting ambitious new sustainability goals with the city of Cambridge. These gaps led to five key recommendations. First, coordination. Internally, MIT should create a position in the PKG or VPR's office dedicated to regularly convening researchers who are influencing climate policy so that they can cross pollinate. This individual should also lead the coordination of an annual MIT climate policy conference. To foster external coordination with policymakers, MIT should create a parallel position in the DC office charged with sourcing opportunities for legislators to learn from MIT researchers and vice versa. Lastly, we should centralize resources. Specifically, the climate portal should have a page detailing all stakeholders at MIT that are directly interfacing with climate policymakers. This way, we create the opportunity for other faculty and students to take advantage of this network. Next, in addition to coordinating those who are already influencing policy, there should be a concerted effort to support and incentivize more researchers to do the same. Concretely, the internal position described earlier should hold workshops and distribute resources on how to develop policy forward materials on climate. Promotion, tenure, and hiring decisions should account for a candidate's policy influence. Finally, MIT needs to encourage students to move the needle on climate policy in their careers and should therefore ramp up public sector representation at career fairs. Additional funding would extend MIT's incredible policy connections to more of our community. By offering clear and accessible funds, MIT can expand these opportunities for students and early career researchers. Examples include PKG Climate Fellows and Policy Forward Research Positions for undergrad and graduate students. This support would align well with the Climate Grand Challenges and serve as a much needed parallel to the new Climate and Sustainability Consortium. Finally, MIT should join and lead local cities to accelerate sustainability goals. Students want MIT to strengthen these partnerships and then problem solve together to carry those goals forward. Engaging decision makers is a great way to inspire change. In our full report, we offer ways to measure and ensure the success of these partnerships. Because after all, there is no time like the present to inform climate policy. MIT affiliates are in key positions to do so, not just in DC, but locally and globally. If we get this right, we can lead the way towards lasting partnerships that address the climate challenge. This presentation is on student priorities and propositions for MIT's investments. Our hope is to reflect how MIT can take stronger climate action through incorporating environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, values in its investments. ESG investing is both a monetary and a moral win-win for MIT. Studies have shown that ESG has a positive impact on equity returns, and many of MIT's peer schools have already adopted ESG principles. The priorities that follow are in the best interest of our endowment and of society. We underline that investment is just one of many modes of external engagement. Unlike in the 2015 Climate Action Plan, we urge MIT to view investments, research, donations, and other external relationships as unique paths that will each have their own goals and standards. Our first priority is transparency and public commitments. There is very little information to be found online or accessible to all regarding the endowment, MIT's next steps on its climate policy, or even guiding values regarding its financial endeavors. We're not sure where MIT is going or where we currently stand. We thus want to see MIT make its endowment principles and important decisions public to the world. We recently learned that among its 12 peer institutions, MIT is severely lacking in clarity in respect to their endowment. As Jasmine mentioned time and time again, ESG principles correlate with stronger returns. We urge MIT to be more transparent in our financial endeavors. Our second priority is climate and ESG oriented portfolio goals. A clearly expressed purpose not only unifies Matimco with the MIT community, but also provides a framework for consistent decision making and long term financial returns. An annual statement of purpose is a space to match goals to the time frame of the current climate action plan. We ask that Matimco describes how it plans to build upon its ex existing involvement in Climate Action 100 Plus as an active shareholder of companies. 
Our third priority is creating a framework for accountability and community input. In our report, we propose a Standing Committee on Investor Responsibility, or SCIR, which follows a similar structure to standing committees at our peer schools. Unlike existing corporation committees, the SCIR would solely address responsible investing issues with student representation, accessible meetings, and transparent records and recommendations, along with an online community feedback and proposal form and a biannual community town hall. Additionally, the SCIR will be responsible for drafting the statement of purpose, completing annual reporting, and addressing ethical and environmental investing dilemmas. This permanent framework for accountability ensures that voices at MIT are heard in the case of climate issues and beyond. Next, Arnav will discuss a strong student perspective on the endowment. Thank you, Anushree. A specific action that many students ask MIT to take is fossil fuel divestment. Fossil fuel divestment is the divestiture of the endowment from any holdings and investments in the fossil fuel industry. With that being said, why divestment? The fossil fuel industry has continued to contribute to climate change while simultaneously engaging in anti-democratic processes such as climate disinformation, greenwashing, and anti-climate lobbying campaigns, which have continued since the first MIT Climate Action Plan was written. Through a public commitment to divestment, MIT has the opportunity to remove complicity with bad behavior, generate positive returns by actually investing in clean technologies, and promote pro-science morals and values through this public statement. As seen in this chart here, this is an action that many students want. Those surveyed among the undergraduate community overwhelmingly support this action. Over the last year, in particular, Fossil fuel divestment has become a staple of climate action at many other schools with comparable prestige. MIT is certainly already late to the game. So to the administration, we ask that they seize the opportunity to incorporate the priorities presented here, show a commitment to sustainability through investments, and above all, be the leader in climate action that MIT is meant to be. And now the private sector working group which will present on other forms of engagement besides investments. Hi, my name is Kiara Wanshaft and I'm here with my fellow students, Yeji Cho and Jess Cohen. We recognize the value of allowing MIT community members to freely study what they choose, but the climate crisis is too threatening, too imminent to approach without shared community guidelines that ensure we are most effectively protecting this planet. The Epstein crisis showed the need for private sector engagement guidelines and led to the outside engagements report. Engaging with stakeholders implicated in the climate crisis, like fossil fuel companies, outrightly violates these guidelines. How so? The very first red light question asks if institutional partners have supported or engaged in activities that compromise US national security. Well, President Biden has clearly named climate change a national security concern. So yes, fossil fuel companies trigger this red light. The first yellow light question asks if engaging with an institutional partner impacts MIT's ability to promote our core values in our community. We cannot promote values like academic integrity when we support companies that spread climate disinformation. So fossil fuel companies trigger this yellow light. As the report states, if you are not sacrificing anything to fulfill your values, your values are meaningless. We define engagement across four different dimensions. Note that the standards MIT holds our investments to can be different from the standards we follow for these four types of private sector engagement. The standards presented here are from MIT Divest's standards report. We also looked at the Union of Concerned Scientists scorecard for companies and Barnard College's engagement standards. We chose to use and support MIT Divest standards because we found them to be most aligned with MIT values and most applicable to MIT. The first standard is zero tolerance for climate disinformation. We believe spreading climate disinformation is directly opposed to MIT's mission to generate, disseminate, and preserve knowledge. Our second standard focuses on organizations' greenhouse gas emissions and their target reductions. MIT must make it clear in both our words and actions that we believe climate change is a global threat. And thus we must also ensure our partners are serious about their own contributions to climate change. Third, MIT should not engage with organizations who give money to climate deniers, either directly through political contributions 
or indirectly through think, think tanks. Again, it is against MIT's mission as an institution that strives to bring truth to the world's greatest challenges, such as climate change. Therefore, this standard states that MIT should not engage with such organizations. I'll now pass it off to Yeji to go through the remaining standards. The fourth standard evaluates stakeholders' commitment to a clean energy portfolio, as well as their disclosure of climate risk. MIT should not engage with companies whose external statements and internal actions fail to align, nor should it engage with companies who allocate resources towards unsustainable development. Next, the fifth standard is zero tolerance for anti-climate lobbying. Engagement with companies lobbying against pro-climate policy directly violates MIT's mission to advance knowledge and scientific progress. Finally, the last standard evaluates fossil fuel stakeholders' recognition and reparations for prior unsustainable actions. This standard recognizes that entities are capable of change over time, and given sufficient reparations, MIT should be willing to engage towards future progress. It is imperative that MIT implement climate-based standards for engagement with the private sector. These standards should be quantitative and clear on whether entities pass or do not pass. The report on outside engagements provides a good example of this format. In order to increase accountability, the standard should also be publicly available and ideally developed with input from the broader MIT community. At the minimum, we ask for MIT to provide annual updates on its engagement with the private sector on the MIT Climate Portal. We also ask for the creation of a committee or working group to create and track these standards. MIT works with all kinds of people and organizations in the pursuit of knowledge and bettering society. We don't ask that MIT stop doing this very important work. We just believe that it's important to hold our partners and collaborators accountable, as well as ourselves. Thank you for your time, and let us know if you have any questions. I'm Naomi, and this is Laiwa and Jasmina, and today we're going to present our ideas for student education in the Climate Action Plan. So first, we'll talk about how MIT is currently doing in this realm, and then talk oh, about our yeah. third idea, which involve the classification of classes, grant funding, and postdoc training. So currently, MIT is ranked just barely above 25% of the 672 registered universities in the STARS rating when it comes to curriculum and sustainability. So clearly we have a lot of room for improvement in the next five years. Still, MIT does have a lot of classes that are related to the environment, and we think it'd be really helpful for students registering if um, there was a list that classified these courses as focused on or related to sustainability. A lot of universities already do this, including the university or including Cornell University and a screenshot of their list is pictured on the right. And now Laiwa will talk about the grant funding idea that we have. Many professors at MIT understand the severity of the climate crisis and the need to educate students about it. But the biggest obstacles they face is the lack of time and funding required to change their curriculums. Therefore, we propose the creation of a grant program to encourage professors to rewrite their curriculums to incorporate sustainability. While the Environmental Solutions Initiative does already offer some funding, a more constant source of funding is important because problem sets get rewritten year to year and teaching staff gets turned over frequently. The grant program will also be used for the creation of new sustainability related classes. Currently, there are only three course six classes and one course 18 class that are somewhat related to sustainability, even though almost half of the students are in those majors. To create more opportunities for students to enroll in classes related to the environment, we propose that MIT funds the development of sustainability related electives in four of the most common courses, course 6, 16, 18, and 20. Next, I'll pass it off to Jasmina, who will talk about training for postdocs. So finally, to expose postdocs to concepts and problems of uh, climate and sustainability, MIT could develop resources for postdocs, including educating postdocs on campus initiatives and sustainability, offering sustainability certificates, and offer sustainability fellowship and grants. And we think this will empower postdocs to become uh, scientists as good citizens and become more active in climate sustainability area. So number one, educating 
postdocs about initiatives and sustainability. Uh, it's, it's important because many students and postdocs come from state universities and countries without being educated on, uh, on this topic. So one possibility to educate could be through the postdoctoral or orientation. Second, uh, sustainability certificates are important because around uh, 70 percent of postdocs will end up in industry and that could have a positive effect beyond MIT uh, which postdocs can bring to their next positions in industry and finally MIT uh, postdoc sustainability fellowships and grants uh, expanding the uh, criteria eligibility to include postdocs in current uh, fellowships and grants and offer more of the small grants where uh, postdocs can train their skills uh, beyond the research. So finally, we have proposed a, a timeline for these um, uh, actions for MIT. Um, thank you for your attention and uh, we are looking forward to hear questions from the audience. Hi, my name is Brinda Somjit. With my fellow presenters Natalie Northrup and Sam Humphreys, in this presentation, we describe how MIT's approach towards campus sustainability should progress. We believe that campus must now grow to become a role model for innovative implementation of emissions, waste, and water reducing interventions. To achieve this, we propose three asks. Our first ask is that MIT actively pursue the establishment of ambitious quantitative institute goals for reduction in campus greenhouse gas emissions, waste generation, and water usage. While the 2015 plan included a goal for reduction in campus emissions, goals for reduction in water usage and waste generation were absent. Many of our peer institutions have established such goals. For example, University of California, Berkeley has set a net zero goal for 2025. Harvard has set a goal to become fossil fuel neutral by 2026, and Cornell has a net zero goal for 2035. For waste reduction, Berkeley is on track to achieve its zero waste goal by 2020, and Stanford has a zero waste goal by 2030. And finally, for reduction in water usage, Berkeley has a goal of 36% reduction in, by 2025, and Harvard has a goal of 30% reduction by 2020. Many of these universities produce research of similar caliber as MIT. They also possess similar amounts of space dedicated to lab research, one of the most energy intensive building types. Therefore, we propose the following timeline of goals for MIT. We believe that goals like these will put MIT on par with peer institutions and provide a framework to achieve institute-wide decarbonization. Such targets will show that sustainability is a fundamental value for MIT and will allow MIT to lead the way for campus sustainability for research institutions worldwide. The second ask is that MIT establishes a body to determine, implement, and monitor steps towards institute goals. This body will aggressively pursue on-campus sustainability goals by determining and implementing emissions, waste, and water reducing steps, doing so in a manner that takes advantage of and appropriately values the expertise of people across campus. This body, the Campus Sustainability Committee, will have four main functions. First, to set goals based on scientific understanding of climate and sustainability impacts and economic and technological feasibility. Second, to determine specific and actionable steps on how to reach campus sustainability goals, ranging from building retrofits to increasing waste education. Third, to monitor progress and generate progress reports that encompass and showcase all facets of campus sustainability, both successes and areas for improvement. And finally, to inform and invite input from the MIT community as it disseminates information through progress reports, open forums, and updates to the centralized progress visualization page. The committee should include stakeholders both from MIT's senior leadership team and from administrative departments, including campus planning and facilities. These administrative departments will be the on the ground change makers for campus climate sustainability goals which will differentiate the committee from the Climate Action Advisory Committee. Finally, we ask that MIT publish transparent, centralized, and accessible data. In order to follow through on its ambitious goals, we feel that MIT needs to present these goals and the progress being made towards these goals in a transparent manner. We feel this is best done through the centralization of data. We ask that MIT centralize its sustainability goals on MIT's climate portal. 
as this is MIT's most general climate space. These goals should be SMART goals with quantifiable targets and specific timelines and should be assigned specific actors primarily responsible for the implementation of each goal. Next, regular progress reports should be updated on this website. For a good example for what these look like, we refer you to Harvard and Princeton sustainability websites, which provide a nice combination of goal presentation and progress reports. Next, in order to follow through on its stated goal of being a test bed for faculty, student, and staff ideas, we feel that it's very important for MIT to present detailed, publicly available data on waste, water, and energy use. On waste, we feel that MIT needs to conduct more waste audits in order to get a better sense of waste on campus and provide a more granular breakdown of waste by purchasing entity. On water, we feel that MIT needs to publicly share its stormwater and landscape ecology master plan. And finally, on energy use, we'd like to see MIT release all of its cost benefit analyses on on campus sustainability projects designed to reduce emissions, as this will keep the MIT community as a whole informed. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to thank um, the students who have obviously put in an incredible uh, amount of uh, amount of work um, in all these areas, and I think we're very grateful to have this input. So, um, so I'd like to start off by asking a couple of questions, and then I'd I'd like to um, to ask the uh, Climate Action Advisory Committee to be thinking of questions that that you could ask uh, after I um, ask the first couple. So, um, so first of all, to the um, the I think it was the first presentation that. Uh, that dealt with um, the uh, structure of the climate action plan. Um, so we, we have a, uh, a climate action advisory committee that meets a half time, you know, half dozen times a year. And it really sounds like you're talking about um, uh, adding a bunch of subcommittees to, uh, to a committee like that. So right now you're, you're calling for a steering committee that includes a lot of senior administrators, although, you know, currently the, the, uh, the committee that we have includes um, representation from, uh, from, from people at all levels across the, um, the institute and is, is, uh, is a completely uh, non-hierarchical um, way of getting input in. So, um, so I, I, uh, I, I, I think it would be unfortunate if we, if we, um, made this hierarchical um, and um, and so maybe uh, Laura or uh, or any of the people who worked on that can talk about how they're they're thinking about this in a way that um, that makes sure we continue to get um, input uh, at all levels across the institute um, without making it um, appear that it's too top down because a you know a final decision committee that just includes senior administrators is, is something that we've been working hard to, uh, to avoid, so. Yeah, definitely. So I think to talk a little bit about what we see as the main difference between this Climate Council proposal and like the already existing Climate Action Advisory Committee is that the Climate Council is more of a governing body. So um, hopefully that would actually kind of reduce any kind of hierarchical issues there. And so the actual doers would be the members of uh, those committees that are underneath that um, overall steering council, like with, which is consistent of those vice president roles. And so there's considerable overlap between the membership of the committees and then the higher up steering council, but the committees are really kind of uh, driving and um, at the wheel. And then there'd be just kind of the feasibility and approval checks um, higher up at the, at the steering council level. So does that paint a better picture of like the climate council structure that that we were talking about? Yeah. So um, yeah. So I I no. It's it's um yeah. I'm trying to balance the idea of trying to get input in at as many levels as possible without becoming um, bureaucratic and you know decisions not being able to get made because things are always tied up at some uh, level of committee. So um so so I mean it's a it's a it's a very interesting idea, and I think it's you know something that we'll take back and want to. Um, I, I think the uh, CAAC will um, think about uh, you know how 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 that this how this would actually work in terms of implementation. So thank you. Um, 
Okay, so let me let me ask um, one more question here before I um, I uh, ask others on the Climate Action Advisory uh, Committee. Um, uh, so the um, uh, I'm going to ask actually um, uh, Bob Armstrong and then um, John Fernandez to um, to uh, talk to us a little bit about the uh, the energy miner, which uh, Mighty implements, and then the the uh, sustainability environment sustainability miner that ESI implements, because both of those make lists of courses that are available for anybody who wants to do a minor. So you're asking for all the courses to be listed, but we have two minors that list lots and lots of uh, courses. And, um, and I'm also going to ask them um, about how many minors are currently signed up um, because, uh, because I think there's plenty of room in, in both of those areas for new minors um, to populate courses. So before we make new courses and make new lists of courses, um, I, I think it's worth having some discussion about um, are the students taking full advantage of the opportunities that we're currently providing and, um, and if we're not, um, what do we need to do to get the word out to the students about the opportunities um, that exist? So, um, so Bob, maybe can you, um, can you start us off on that and tell us a little about the, um, the energy miner? Sure, thank you, Maria. Um, and, and thanks to the students for those really nice presentations. Yeah. So Fantastic. obviously a lot of work has gone into those. Um, so Mighty launched the energy miner um, somewhere around 2010, uh, not a couple of years after uh, Mighty launched. And, and the part, part of that discussion was, do we look for an energy major on campus or do we stick with traditional uh, majors uh, and so encourage our students to, to get majors in, a, in depth uh, in, in a traditional discipline like chemistry or physics or mechanical engineering or uh, economics. Uh, and then pr we provide through the energy minor a coherent overlay of subjects that the students could take to help help them better understand the, the energy opportunities uh, of their major. Uh, and it's a way also to get students together from across uh, multiple disciplines, uh, both in the classroom and, and in other other venues. Uh, so we, we, when we launched the minor, um, we ramped up uh, over the first couple of years to about uh, 35 students a, a year in the minor, coming from all five of MIT's uh, schools. Um, we, we went through a change in our, our education director uh, left to become the executive director of ESI, which was great. Uh, but, but, but I think that set back our uh, education program. And so we have been rebuilding uh, the pipeline there and we're back up uh, near, near 20 uh, students. In our minors, there, there's a set of requirements that include uh, uh, one of two options in the science of energy, it could be physics of energy or an earth sciences uh, course. Uh, there's a social science of energy course, uh, energy uh, economics, uh, uh, Chris Knittle, I think, on the on the the panel here uh, teaches that um, th there is a technology of, of energy subject, and then economics, which is core to many of the the subjects. So, so a number of of required subjects, and then a whole host of options, uh, including project courses. Uh, one of the things we focused on at, at Mighty is developing a rich set of Europe's. Uh, so maybe 40 or 50 Europs a year that we can offer to undergraduates to let them uh, get in and, and develop uh, experience in energy uh, th through, through the research or a solar spring break, installing solar in uh, economically challenged regions of, of uh, California, uh, for, for example. So there's this broad range of, of uh, both classroom subjects and laboratory or, or experiential um, opportunities. As, as Maria mentioned, there's a, a large catalog of, of subject students can take uh, that we've funded through curriculum 
uh, development funds or, or that are already out there. There's significant overlap with the list with uh, ESI, which I think reflects, I think, some of the common uh, threads there. Um, so that's a, that's a quick look at it. Um, we, we would love to work with the students to understand where there are holes and, and, and where we might uh, uh, offer other opportunities, um, in, including work. One of my interests is how, how do we work more in developing countries uh, and get our students engaged there. What, what, once we have the, the, the coronavirus um, pandemic in the rearview mirror. Great. Thanks, Bob. Now I'm going to um, turn it over to John. And John, um, make sure you talk about uh, the, um, the climate sustainability content in the, the GIRs that uh, the ESI has been working on. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So um, the Environmental Solutions Initiative there, I've said it, um, uh, is, uh, has an environment and sustainability minor, um, which currently, it's about four years old. Um, Bob's right. Um, the 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 lead education person at Mighty helped me set it up. Um, and we're, we're pretty happy with it um, because we have a pipeline of about 30 students enrolled. That looks to be a fairly robust number year in, year out. Um, it is a minor, and, and just as a reminder, you know, MIT undergrads have um, enormous opportunities to take minor or something like 54 minors um, in departments. These, th this minor, the environmental sustainability minor, is one of the integrative minors that you can take um, from, any, from any department in, in, in any major. So the, the intent of the minor is to offer a broad overview of environment and sustainability subject matter across the departments, across all five schools. And I would say that the, the population that we serve, for the most part, are those who are deeply interested. These are um, MIT undergrads who often come to MIT already with a, with a deep interest in sustainability issues. They arrive at MIT, we have a good cohort of students who, who go through the Terrascope program. And then the minor serves their interests to dive much more deeply, whether it be in earth and, earth and atmospheric planetary sciences or on policy questions um, or on engineering for, for the climate, a, a variety of different subjects. We are um, continually evolving the minor so Noel Celine, um, professor in um, head of technology and policy program, is developing a class that we will we will be launching its its final versions soon, and that's meant to be a, 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 a quite a broad overview of sustainability, and is is meant to be a, a, a an attractor into the minor, but also to serve. Um, students not necessarily taking the minor. So that program, I think we're pretty happy about that. I think the, um, the, that's one end of the spectrum of the MIT student community that we, we are mandated to serve. The other end of the spectrum are those students who don't come to MIT with a particular interest in sustainability and the environment. Um, and so we've approached that group of students, which is a much larger group of students, with another effort. Um, that was a, it's a project that we're now finishing with the first phase of uh, funding to insert into the general institute requirements, topics and sustainability. So, so environment and sustainability. And so we've worked with um, 18, 1802, 802, chemistry, biology, um, and other subject matter to insert into the general institute, institute requirements problem sets, portions of lectures and other material um, because those students are a captive audience. They, we believe that we are, we are mandated to lift environmental literacy across the MIT student body. And it's a really excellent way to both serve the needs of those courses for new problem sets, for problem sets that are directly engaged with the real world and also to lift the general literacy um, in a particularly MIT way 
in, uh, introducing topics in the environment and sustainability in those classes. We are now probably going to be launching a second phase pretty soon with additional funding. And the next phase for us is to work with departments to use all of the educational work that we've done through the minor and this GIR project to, um, to establish a, a level of literacy in environmental topics that the departments can then leverage as they begin to teach much more in environment sustainability and climate change. So we're, we're really working across that range of interest. And I think that is necessary for us to do. Um, and we're, we're pretty happy with it right now, but of course the, the ideas that the, that, that the students presented are, are quite interesting and we'd like to move forward on, on some of those ideas. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, th so the reason I um, I asked Bob and John to um, to comment on that is is um, is that in, in the terms of the things they're saying that we need, we're starting to do some of those already. Although uh, although we really appreciate the uh, the input that uh, that we really need to raise our game and amp it up and make uh, what we're doing sort of uh, more. Um, accessible to the students in the case where they, they don't know what's going on. And, and for all of you student leaders who are with us, you know, we could certainly, we could certainly use your help and your input for how this, uh, this content um, is developed. So, um, so I'd like to open it up to, uh, to other members of the uh, CAAC who, who have either um, questions uh, for the student presenters or, or who might have, you know, just reactions to, to what we've uh, heard so far. Ron Prin, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm wondering to the, the extent to which the really excellent uh, group of students and postdocs uh, that have put this uh, presentation together, how much thought has gone into the fact that there still is in the United States in particular a significant, not negligible, but significant portion of people who uh, remain in denial uh, on the science of, of, uh, of climate and, and many other environmental issues. What do you think, what was in the thinking and discussions you had, what do you think MIT can or should be doing or doing better to try to bridge this education gap? Uh, and uh, because this, although it's a minority, as we've all seen, it has political influence and can influence therefore the things that go on and decisions made even in Washington. Okay. Um, so what's the role? Yeah, that students. MIT could play. Students, students postdocs. Who wants to comment on that? So we believe that uh, uh, MIT can only be sustainable uh, if everybody is behaving sustainably. And um, so we started with uh, the classes and when we did the analysis on the MIT's performance uh, within the Association of uh, Sustainability Education, it ranked um, uh, only barely above 25% of the uh, 672 registered universities in curriculum. And that was in the fall. And I think uh, MIT can definitely do better uh, in terms of um, providing sustainability education for students, but also for uh, staff and also for the out outreach. In our memo, we lay out some ideas that were not only for student education, but also for other uh, staff or other community members at MIT and also for the outreach. Well, the... Um yeah, if I could just, can I follow on with that, Ron? Um, yes, so, please go ahead. So the, I, I think the, the key is how do we reach out to, to the, the populations who, who wouldn't get on to say MITx to take an MIT course? So we're, you know, the, the people who would reach out to find us, you know, obviously we can make a connection and, and we can improve a connection. Um, but what about the what about the folks out there who um, who who just uh, um, would would not think to reach out to us to get information? Any ideas for 
for how we could reach out to those populations. Students, you come from all over the country and all over the world. So, so you have a, I think you have a special role to play here. Yeah, um, I think to respond to that, um, the first thing is MIT could engage in like local efforts in climate change. Um, I think some of the policy actions that are happening already look at specific states or communities um, in which these like may deal with these challenges. And I think that is something that should be continued maybe through in emphasis on policy engagement. I also think bringing science into Capitol Hill discussions is also key in this. Um, and it seems like we have a great opportunity now with the connections that MIT can foster between our scientists and um, policymakers. And the policymakers, of course, represent people from across the country. Um, and I think another thing that is important is MIT should definitely still make a, have a clear message in private sector engagement, um, in, especially if we are dealing with um, co corporations or people who do spread climate disinformation, this does contribute to some of the denialism that is still occurring um, today. So yeah, those, those three, I think, are a start. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, Bruce Anderson, Bruce, Bruce is an alum, a former corporation member and works in the clean energy sector. And uh, have you got a, a comment or a question for our students? I, I, I do, and, uh, and thanks, thanks everybody for this. Uh, this session is great, uh, as is Maria's background photograph of Mars. Uh, one of my favorite pictures now of Mars, thank you. Um, <coughs> I started my first solar company <clears throat> just out of school back in 1973. And, and since then, I've had a lot of head-to-head -head battles on the subject of, of good and evil, you know, with fossil, fossil fuel companies and others. And it's, it's a very, very complicated question. By the way, I was also director of the industrial liaison for a while. And, I, I, and, and also, be, of course, being on the corporation, these are very, very thorny issues. Um, good and evil often is not very obvious, particularly of, uh, by companies. Um, and, uh, you know, is this a, a differentiation between, let's say, Exxon, that's doing virtually nothing and some of the oil companies that are and you know, trying to make that transition or um, and, and, and a mining uh, industry or a mining company that's um, really attentive to ESG but is, is um, you know, either mining something we don't approve of or, or something else. Do you have thoughts on how to go about defining who to work with and who not to work with in the corporate community? And who to, who we should take money from, who we shouldn't. This is this is tough stuff, yeah. and um, I don't. <laughs> I I know I can't do it. Um, although you know maybe um, younger people like yourselves, uh, you know, have the uh, particularly as a group, you might have a way of, of doing it that I've never thought about. But it's tricky. Uh, let's see. Would any of the students like to comment on that? Arnov, you must have views on this. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so yeah, no, and I think it's a really important question, right? H how do we ensure that we're looking at a lot of these companies objectively, understanding that you know there's a component of whether or not they're adding to the emissions, there's a component of climate disinformation and anti-climate lobbying. Um, actually, MIT Divest created uh, a report that we released about a week ago that's out, that outlines standards that we think uh, should be implemented when looking at uh, our, our standards were for investments specifically for fossil fuel companies. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think the private sector engagement working group for students also were inspired by those standards as well as the standards of the Union of Concerned Scientists and Barnard College, which also did a very similar study um, that analyzed a variety of different kind of metrics and requirements for a lot of these companies. Um, but to that, to the end of, you know, what, how, and so, so you might want to take a look at that. I can, I can also send that to you maybe after, mm -hmm. um, you know, it has also a, a really good qualitative assessment section where we kind of list off more qualitative information regarding a lot of these companies. But the point being that um, we understand that a lot of different companies, a lot of companies are different. But it's important that we come up with the standards as a, as a community to determine that similar to how the outside engagements report worked for those specific engagements um, and, and, and use that as a means to figure out 
who we're invested in and, and as well as who we should engage with research in or accept donations from. Um, and so, so I, I, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is that there is nuance, right? But there are also patterns that we see with respect to climate disinformation and anti-climate lobbying that sometimes apply to the entire uh, industry. And uh, the standards exercise that we were talking about references that. So I, I can definitely send it after this meeting to you. And um, I think at, at some point, Kiara, I think we're gonna send out the reports of all the student working groups that, that helped out with this. Um, and those will also have links to resources that we used um, and, and that the private sector engagement working group used in analyzing how we should look at those relationships. Kiara, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Sorry if I, I kind of kind of like jumped in on the yeah, uh, question, but go yes. ahead. And the, the URLs for the reports will be projected at the end. So definitely please stay uh, to be able to read all that information. But um, Bruce, it's a great point and something we thought a lot about. And I think just at a high level, you know, there is the consideration of what is the value of working with these actors and working with these stakeholders to move them in the right direction, right? right. Um, but, and that's a valid consideration. But I think our point here is, you know, there are a lot of stakeholders who MIT could be engaging with and we need to be judici judicious in those decisions. And therefore, you know, we need to have some framework that tells us it's not really worth engaging with that stakeholder because they're just too far in this direction and they're just not moving with the rest of the world towards clean energy. But once they're here, you know, once they've reached this level in the framework, then you know we're all for it. MIT should work with them. MIT should help them. But while they're still spreading climate misinformation and misleading our nation and our world, maybe we should work with other people because there are other people who we could choose to be with instead. Yeah, so I just wanna say, moving on to some of the um, uh, questions that we're getting from the audience now, we, um, we have requests here uh, for students, um, if you would be willing to uh, share your slides with the participants here today, um, uh, we would be um, we would be happy, um, and, and we'd like to, in fact, um, uh, post them on the climate action website at MIT, so um, so others uh, others could see them. Uh, you know, as well as the reports uh, that the students have done, um, Arna, uh, that Arna refer, uh, referred to. Um, can I can I just ask a follow on uh, question, uh, Kiara? Um, it, you know, staying staying with this topic. Um, you, you kind of uh, call out fossil fuel companies, but what about uh, airlines or car manufacturers or uh, you know, people who make inefficient air conditioning for buildings? I mean, why, why, um, why are they uh, exempt from, from this as, um, and, um, and fossil fuel companies are a target? Because some fossil fuel companies are of course trying to diversify their portfolios and become broader um, energy companies and you know some of them uh, which may have uh, spread disinformation the people who did that and made those decisions are no longer with these companies and these companies are are of course trying to you know what i call uh modernize so if if, if uh if you if the students could uh comment on on any aspects of those i, I think uh the participants here would appreciate it yeah, and actually, so our standards, um, we did kind of shift them. And again, you can read a little bit more in the report, um, but they are applicable to non-fossil fuel companies as well, because it's a great point. I think that, you know, we can't just blame fossil fuel companies for a lot of this. Um, you know, a lot of other companies are implicit in this. So, so definitely we want to apply standards to those as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to add there. Okay, I have, I, a, I have another I have another audience. Uh, did somebody want to say something? Did one of the students want to comment there? Um, I just wanted to add that we recently joined the Climate Action 100 Network, the um, MIT Corporation, and they actually have three asks that are actually encompassing of um, any company, regardless of whether they're involved in fossil fuels or climate disinformation. And their three asks are to implement a strong governance framework for the company board to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and provide enhanced corporate disclosure and kind of disregarding the past history of any of these companies, taking these steps kind of improves them for the future. And those are actually um, criteria that we can be a lead investor in um, influencing through shareholder res resolutions for those companies. And we can also incorporate ESG criteria ourselves within the corporation to set an example for all of these companies to move forward in a more sustainable way. 
Great, thank you. Um, let, let's see, we've got another uh, question from the audience here. Um, concerning the MIT student body, are we doing enough to recruit and then graduate, graduate more committed student environmentalists like the ones who've uh, presented today? So you're all role models to people out there. Um, in both our undergraduate and graduate programs. So, um, so maybe that's a question for the students about, um, you know, are, are we doing enough to educate you and both provide opportunities for, for, for you in the, these areas? Um, uh, Nushri, I think you, uh, you, you were mute. Nushri, I think you were trying to say something and you were muted. But... No? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, Kelly, yes. please I'm weigh in. Speak on this. So I'm also a co-chair of the UA uh, Undergraduate okay. Associations Committee on Sustainability. And um, just based on a survey that we conducted in the fall, um, around 50% of respondents, over like 700 respondents to this question, are considering sustainability as a factor in their career plans, um, which I think is a big statistic. And it shows that students are um, either becoming more aware of sustainability as they go through their education in college um, or something is like students are interested. And I think another stat that is important is that four and five of respondents also around 700 um, consider sustain or sustainability in their daily lives. So I think in terms of awareness, um, it's something that definitely the student body is thinking about and is actively thinking about in their career plans as well. In terms of how we can improve this, I think definitely continuing education efforts, continuing also the work that all of these student leaders here today um, are doing in the sustainability spaces and having that support structure between students and administration or um, between students and other groups on campus that make this work more effective and more um, impactful, I think will only augment the efforts um, that we have in helping students today. Great, thank you. Um, Brian Goldberg, do you have a comment or a question? Um, yeah, um, th uh, thank you, students. Uh, I really want to commend, um, sounds like the listening and outreach you've done. Uh, you've hit on just certainly a number of key points. And I was curious, there were two emerging areas that came up through your presentations that I think are somewhat new compared to the first version of the Climate Action Plan. Those two emerging areas I heard from you are uh, what we might call scope three, the kind of indirect emissions. Um, and also, I think I heard mention of stormwater in a sense of how is MIT adapting to the changes in climate both today and in the future. Uh, both emerging areas are areas that there certainly has been quite a bit of work on campus the last few years to try to get our hands around um, what do these areas of scope three look like. And uh, uh, there seem to be a lot of crossover in scope three as an example, the things that we buy to meet the MIT mission. Well, we have vendors that we spend hundreds of millions of dollars with, Amazon, IT companies, lab supply companies. So it would seem to be a really great opportunity to test some of these strategies with our vendors uh, on campus. Um, and so I was wondering if anything came out on that front in terms of the private sector group or the on-campus sustainability group. And then similarly with stormwater, that's another emerging area of how we're managing stormwater from changes in climate. Uh, there's other opportunities and tests that we're learning about as a campus with research faculty, researchers, faculty, and staff, and how might we share some of these models with our partners uh, globally by solving these issues locally. So I'm curious if, as the students learned about these two emerging issues, um, if you could talk a little bit more about the appetite and interest among the student body and the stakeholders you spoke with to cover these two emerging areas that um, perhaps could be in the next climate action plan. Something just real quick on the on the private sector engagement point that you brought up. I think um, you know the new sustainability consortium is a great example of this sort of MIT really applying its skills and its knowledge to help you know actors who exist today uh, improve their sustainability. Um, I think that En-ROADS actually provides a really good example of how we measure success. So producing like really clear metrics and. Um, uh, a framework for what is success in terms of that engagement and then having like a third party that comes in and measures that um, would be awesome because then we in the very MIT problem solving way can iterate and make sure that we are most effectively helping these private sector uh, communities improve their uh, sustainability. 
Great, thanks. Um, uh, let me take another um, uh, question here from um, from the audience. So, reaching out and influencing policy might be enhanced by leveraging alumni. What options might exist or might be envisioned for students and alumni collaboration to have a larger impact on policy companies and community action? So, students. Uh, what do you think about engaging our alums? Kiara? Sorry, could you say that one more time? Um, reaching out and influencing policy might be enhanced by leveraging alumni. What options might exist or might be envisioned for students and alumni collaboration to have a larger impact on policy companies and community action? Yeah, I think David might have something on this. Yeah, David. Sure, thank you, Kara. So I, I think uh, uh, this is a great question about how MIT as an institution can better uh, leverage its influence. Uh, and this sort of speaks to Professor Prin's question earlier as well, I think. The, I think as MIT ramps up its educational capacity on campus for educating students about sustainability and the ways that uh, policy especially can interact with uh, all of the driving forces for uh, creating a greener world, that there will be more and more cohorts of MIT alumni who are out in the world who are, who are educated and are passionate about this and who are connected to specific departments and offices on campus. Um, and so that's something that we hope uh, that uh, Dr. Armstrong and Fernandez can can work on uh, going forward as well as they're looking into those educational initiatives. I think also, um, you know, the MIT community has entrepreneurs, has policy experts uh, in it, and uh, that is one of the things that we ask for that be included in MIT's climate portal as we're trying to network uh, students and faculty with some of these influencers in the public and private sectors. Great, thank you. Uh, John Fernandez, you've got a, your hand yeah, raised. I've got a, a comment and a question that I think brings together a number of themes here. So throughout the presentations, uh, the student presentations, you alluded to a number of existing assets at MIT, the ESI, MIT, and others. And, um, you know, on many of the things that you're suggesting that MIT should be doing more of, uh, it seems to me that enhancing, supporting, and expanding the existing assets is probably the best way to do that. Um, and and what I mean what I mean by existing assets is, of course, the ESI, Mighty, Seeper, uh, JWAFs, the Joint Program, the Sustainability Initiative at Sloan, and I'm I'm sure I'm missing several others, but there's a very rich landscape of existing assets that enhanced and expanded. Um, would I think serve us very well because we already have very deep and very positive relationship with the faculty. We have a, 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 an ongoing um, relationship with the alumni and, and on and on. So I guess my question is, have you thought the students generally about what that would look like, enhancing and expanding, or is that, do you think that's a, uh, an important thing to do? O open question. I think um, this is this is something that that came up repeatedly. Actually, that that MIT has deep strength in many of these areas, whether it's education, research, outreach, policy work, um, but that many of these initiatives are fragmented across campus. And that was one of the guiding lights in our proposal to have a central uh, steering committee that uh, would be able to coordinate all of these efforts across campus, in addition to the reporting mechanisms on a centralized website. I think it's difficult for students and also for, I'm sure, for faculty to navigate what are, all, uh, what are all the resources that are available on campus to get a picture of what MIT's various efforts are in all of these areas uh, when there is no central reporting structure, when there is no central, uh, account centrally accountable council uh, that includes members of the community. And I think that, that figuring out how to best leverage the many strengths that exist on campus in all of these different institutions uh, is something that we hope that uh, happens uh, in this new uh, climate action plan uh, process. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, 
so um, so unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time, and it's it's gone by quickly. Um, but the uh, the material was just so fascinating, and I, I think it's clear that the uh, the students have done an incredible um, amount of uh, of work on this. So. Uh, Jasmina, Lara, Kelly, Anushri, Kiara, and David, uh, thank you so much to you and your teams for the efforts that you've put in. Um, I want to emphasize that this is one of um, many uh, uh, outreach activities that we're performing you know, over the course of the, the year to get um, input into um, the next climate action plan. and. Um, and we will be uh, we will be continuing. We're going to have a couple of uh, forums on engagement within our communities and engagement outside MIT. And um, and I hope that uh, everybody will continue to engage and get your input in. So um, so thanks to all the students. Thanks to the uh, committee for their reflections. And um, uh, have a have a great day. And I really appreciate the participation. And also. Uh, the questions that came from uh, our audience today as well. So thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.